My Govan, and welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel and the Tolkien Geek, and happy Hobbit Day once again. This is 2024, and as usual, the Fellowship of Tolkien Tubers has put together a collaborative playlist of lots of Hobbit Day content for you to consume. Given that this is so close to my usual release date, this is the only video you're getting from me this week, so don't look for another one tomorrow, but at least, you know, you've got this one. And in my mind, this idea popped up as I was thinking about a couple of different lines, and the two lines are, well, one is from Frodo and one is from Aragorn, and they're not the only two lines necessarily that are pertinent to this topic, but... In Aragorn's words, when discussing the fact that the Brelanders are kind of suspicious of rangers and don't really get on well with him, uh, he says, if simple folk are kept free from dangers, simple they will be. And he's referring to the fact that rangers basically keep Bree safe from who knows what kind of evil that would destroy their little town but for the vigilance of the rangers. And he's making the point that, you know, if you just let them stay in that simple state where they're never really aware even of the danger that is all around them, they're not going to have a reason to understand what the rangers really are and why they're important. And then there was another line by Frodo near the end of the book where the hobbits have returned to the Shire, or very nearly returned to the Shire, and one of the hobbits mentions that it's it feels like they're, you know, waking up from a dream because of all the things that have happened seems so unreal, basically. And Frodo says, no, to me it feels more like falling back to sleep. And this kind of echoes something that he talked about with Gandalf very early in the book, where he was talking about how stupid hobbits are and how he wished a dragon would kind of show up and wake them all up a little bit because it might do them some good. And these all touch on this theme, which is a fairly common theme in these kinds of stories, which is the idea of awakening and the loss of innocence, but not in a, uh, not in a very narrow sense. They have a very, this, both of these lines have a very broad application, because they speak to both the value of innocence, especially Aragorn's line, but also the value of the loss of that innocence. And innocence not in a not in a cynical type of sense, but a innocence of the nature of just not being aware of things. There is a certain value to that in some ways, but there's also a value in the opposite, because Having the innocence of not being aware of things is useful in the sense of you don't have as many temptations and reasons to go astray that you might otherwise because you're just not aware of them. On the other hand, the innocence that is lost in, in learning about these things is what, that loss of innocence is what grows you into a more mature person in a lot of ways. So the Brelanders are kind of in the position of being children, in a sense. Whereas Frodo, at the end of his adventure, is now in the more in the position of being a mature adult, and coming back to the Shire is like going back to sleep in that kind of childlike state of being not exactly unaware of everything, but going back to this little world which is so cut off from everything else that it's not, you know, even though he knows more about what's out there and everything else, it's still like going back to that kind of childlike state where there's just not really any interaction with it anymore because the Shire is so insular and there's none of that stuff really comes inside of it. So I wanted to explore this a little bit more and really dig into it because, like with many other stories, as I said, this gets explored throughout the story, and it's treated in a fairly nuanced way, I think, even though it's not necessarily one of the more obvious and prominent themes of the book. There's definitely an element of it throughout, and we could see that in the eyes of a lot of different characters. Frodo, of course, learns 
steadily as time goes on how naive even he is relative to other people, even though relative to other hobbits, he's quite knowledgeable and mature. So he runs into Gildor and he says things like, you know, I never expected danger to find me in my own shire. And Gildor says, but it's not your own shire. You can fence out the world, but you, I mean, you can fence yourselves in, but you can't fence the world out. And so we already see in lines like that, that Frodo, despite having more awareness of the outside world, isn't really understanding the consequences of what it means for that outside world to be there and have real things. And he kind of gains more knowledge about what that means for him as the tale goes on. And of course, part of this is, and I, I've talked a little bit about the transitional chapters that we get with Tom Bombadil and the Barrow Whites. I've done like a series on those chapters. A lot of that is where some of Frodo's growth happens. And it's not the only place where Frodo's growth happens, but certainly a lot of it happens there. And it's kind of a very traditional, fairy tale like transitional part of the story. I mean, we even go through a forest, which is a old, old fairy tale trope of, you know, the, the forest is a place of change, of growth, of transformation. Something happens there. So you've got that whole thing going on. And the hobbits as a, as a group start to really learn this is really dangerous <laughs> because they run into a lot of different things that they just were not expecting and which terrify them, frankly, but also help them start to take their own adventure more seriously. But even in Bree, they're not taking it 100% seriously because Aragorn is going to scold them for basically being way too lazy about keeping their own identities and mission under wraps because Pippin goes off and starts just chatting up with the locals about all kinds of stuff that he really shouldn't be saying and Frodo has to stop him. So Pippin is still very much in the mode of eh, nothing matters, you know, we're all fine. <laughs> and Frodo, for his own part, is kind of unaware of just how immature Pippin is. Pippin has to mature a lot in this story because he starts out as completely you know, irresponsible almost. Uh, but you get a lot of these different moments in the story. And then, of course, Sam, we start to see his growth later on in the story when he starts being really the main second character after Frodo and slowly kind of takes over as main character as their track in, in the story goes forward because he has to take on more and more responsibility and he has more and more you know, worries and cares that normally kind of would have been Frodo's part to carry, but now he has to do it because Frodo is, his entire energy is kind of eaten up with just resisting the ring. And so he ends up having to take on a lot more of that kind of growth and become the mature adult who can make sure that they make it through. Now, that's not to say that Frodo becomes an immature non-adult in that part of the story, but he's just, he's weighed down so much by the ring and everything else that he doesn't have time to think about everything and Sam does a lot of that for him and so Sam grows a lot during that whole process. Now it's not even true necessarily that the hobbits are the only ones who have exactly this kind of growth. Even Legolas and Gimli seem to have a little bit of that because as Legolas will tell Aragorn you know, you've traveled more than me. I know less about whatever's going on in Fangorn Forest than you do, probably. Because Aragorn's like, I would have thought an elf of the woods would know what, you know, Celeborn was warning us about. And he's like, I haven't traveled around. I don't know nothing. <laughs> so we even see that they, for all their age and experience, don't necessarily know everything because they've also been in their insular little you know, communities where they don't get exposure to everything else outside. And this whole idea is, like I said, common to a lot of stories, and The Lord of the Rings is hardly the first one to explore it, but it's worth exploring in a lot of different stories because there's so many facets to the idea. In particular, in going back to Aragorn's line about simple people who are protected will remain simple, 
this is kind of the point of parenthood, right? This is one of the goals of parents, in my mind anyway, should be to keep their children innocent until they're ready to be less innocent. There are certain things that children shouldn't be introduced to until they're old enough to really handle the ideas or the the topics or whatever it is because you're not ready at the age of three or four to really, you know, talk about things like, say, I don't know, war, really? Not not in the sense of the real cost and, and tragedy of war. You're just not ready for that kind of deep stuff, right? And there's a lot of ways that you could approach that. It's not just things that you learn about in school or whatnot. I mean, there's just a ton of different things that you're not ready for until you reach a certain age and level of maturity. And it's the job of parents to bring children to the level of maturity that they need to be able to learn about those topics. And that is, in a lot of ways, a process of losing your innocence and becoming more not worldly wise exactly, but at least more aware of the things in the world that are just not pleasant. And, you know, as as Tolkien once said, death is kind of the chief theme of the story, which the first time I heard that, I was a little bit weirded out by it because it seemed not really accurate. But the longer you think about it and the more you really look at the story, the more you realize where he's getting this because... When you think about it in one way, death is the natural end process of maturation. I mean, things are born, they grow and mature, and then they die. So there's a metaphorical sense in which all of the hobbits are moving toward death simply by losing their innocence, because part of that is just the natural growth process. But also there's a death of, you know, I mean, you could call that the death of innocence in a way. But there's also a somewhat more literal sense in which when you start moving down this road, the things that you have to learn and do to become a truly mature person actually do hasten your death. I mean, there's what we know now from science is that stress, you know, ages you and age kills you ultimately. So... There's a sense in which these things kill you faster because just because you know them. And, you know, the more seriously you take them, which is the sign of being mature, the more they'll stress you out and the earlier that you'll die as a result. Now, I'm not, you know, it's not like a really direct linear correlation, but there's a certain sense in which that is almost literally true. And so Aragorn is, in a way, almost saying, you know, these people are kind of just, children until you know they have to learn otherwise and as a result they just lead happy little lives and they're you know (laughs) they're just blissfully unaware of what's going around all around them and not that far away and as a result they just kind of in a sense live without any fear because that's just the way they are And death and fear are also very closely connected because this goes back to the whole Morgoth corruption of mankind where he uses the fear of death to kind of corrupt man and that's also what Sauron uses to corrupt the Numenorians. So death and fear are also very coupled together. And so again, you get this kind of metaphorical interplay of how maturation in in the loss of innocence moves you into something like a metaphorical death because now you have that fear right if you don't know about the troll two days north that could come down anytime you wanted to if the rangers weren't making sure he didn't you're not afraid of that but when you do or when you're aware of that and you become afraid there's a part of you that dies right? The, the the innocent, happy part of you that didn't even think about trolls. <laughs> That's gone now. Now you have to be worried about it. Now you have to be an adult and think about it responsibly and plan for it. And there's, there's also this idea, you know, and this, again, this is another old idea, because if you even go back to the Bible, when talking about 
the resurrection, Jesus says, you know, you you don't have a grain grow out of the ground unless the seed dies first. There he's referring to the resurrection, but metaphorically, you could think of that in the same kind of way applied to this idea of innocence and the loss of innocence connected to maturity. Uh, your your child self has to die, in a sense, in order for you to become an adult. You have to leave it behind. Something has to be lost. And that's, in a lot of ways, a, a good and desirable thing. But there's also good and desirable things that get left behind. There is a childlike innocence that would be good to maintain if the world were a better place. And again, that goes back very much to a... Christian and Judaic idea of what the world was originally like in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were childlike in their simplicity, didn't even wear clothes because they didn't even think about it, and then it's only when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they start wearing clothes because they're ashamed and realize, oh wait, this is, this is a problem. There's a sense in which that too is a kind of death because, you know, they lost that innocence and that whole idea gets carried into so many different stories, right? I mean, it's just everywhere. But then looking at the Frodo angle, again, this is where we get the the kind of negative aspect of it. Because he says it's like falling asleep again. Well, do we want to be asleep or do we want to be awake? I mean, some of us might want to be asleep. Some of us need to catch up on sleep. And some of us might want to just be snoozing and dreaming away rather than dealing with the stresses of the outside world. But if you think about it on an objective level, it is better to be awake than to be asleep. You know, when we say somebody's asleep, it's like saying they've got their head stuck in the sand, right? Or like Gandalf says to Pippin, if, if you've gone all this time with, you know, your eyes shut and your ears closed and you don't, and you're basically sleeping through this adventure, you better wake up now. <laughs> you know, that's usually kind of an insult to somebody to say that they're asleep and you know asleep at the wheel or something like that and that's I think kind of the sense that Frodo is getting at he has this idea that they've been on this adventure and they've been awake and now it's like going back to sleep because it's not just the idea of nothing exciting is going to happen anymore but rather the idea that they are going back to a state of almost blissful lack of awareness in some sense, even though they're aware of what's going on in the outside world because they've been through it, they are kind of cocooning themselves back into a, you know, larval state as opposed to being the full-grown butterfly or whatever. So Frodo is kind of expressing that notion of the negative sense in which they're, in a way, regressing. Little do they know when these comments are being made that they're going to have to show off their maturity and, and, and growth when they get to the Shire because they have to kick out Saruman and all that stuff. But even after all that, you know, everything kind of goes back to normal within a few years and then they're, you know, they really have kind of gone back to sleep, as Frodo says. And so Frodo is kind of looking at it from the negative angle of there's a, a loss in going back to that innocence because he knows that the world is not the way we would like it to be. We are not in the Garden of Eden where it's perfectly fine to be innocent and not know about all these things. We live in a world of danger and all kinds of other things that require us to grow up and be mature. And Butterbur realizes this too. He's, you know, whenever the fellowship, what's left of them, move back through Bree and tell him about their adventures you know he tells them about all the troubles they've had in Bree and he says I don't think we ever really appreciated the rangers the way that we should have because when they all left we had all this bad trouble you know he learns the hard way and has to grow up himself and understand things that it wouldn't have been necessarily pleasant but maybe would have done him good to understand before but Aragorn, you know, even points out whenever he says what he says about all that, he says, we would have it no other way. You know, we would rather them be able to live in a semi-Edenic state if we can and let them be simple and shun us because Aragorn and the Rangers know probably better than most what it's like to lose that innocence because Numenor kind of did that in spades 
and the Rangers are the descendants of Numenor. So you've got these positive and negative aspects of innocence, and I think the main point that Frodo's comment brings in is, in the world that we inhabit now, growing out of your innocence is the better alternative because we live in a world that requires it, whereas the Aragorn quote is kind of hearkening back to what it would be like if the world were as we would like it to be, and Aragorn is kind of saying, you know, we like giving some of these people a little bit of that world that could have been. To the extent that we can, we, we are happy to give it to them, even at our own cost. Now, at the end of the day, did that actually do good for the people of Bree, or did that maybe set them up for a little bit more of a shock than they maybe appreciated after the Rangers left? You know, maybe Aragorn should have let them get a little bit more mature before the War of the Ring happened, but at the, at the crisis point, you do have to have that maturity, and the Brelanders have to grow up pretty fast, whereas Frodo, at the end of his journey, is kind of going in the opposite direction by going back to the Shire, because he's going back to this world of nothing outside matters, and, you know, everything is fine and dandy in here, and you even get the line from Frodo about no hobbit has ever killed another hobbit on purpose. That is the kind of thing that you could say of a more or less idyllic society, which is not to say that hobbits are perfect. They're not. You've got the Sackville Bagginses and types like that that are not, you know, 100% good. Nevertheless, the hobbit society is definitely closer to that end of the spectrum than, say, Gondor or any even of the elven societies, because even the elven societies like Lothlorien have their march wardens and whatever to keep the bad guys out. You know, they're not just in there singing away and not heeding the outside world at all. Rivendell might be a little bit more like that because they're further away from, you know, the real dangers. But Lothlorien is not, and certainly the elf king in Mirkwood is not living like that either. So the the Shire and the town of Bree and Rivendell are kind of the only societies that we can see in the story that kind of fit this mold of being pre-fall type Edenic societies in in some minor sense. Obviously they're not that way in a full sense because none of them are completely free of problems and even Rivendell is filled with if not an active response to the outside world at least stories being told of all of these things that happened in their own past. You know, they have stories, you know, songs sung about Eärendil, and Eärendil is like almost the ultimate tragedy because he's the guy who saves Middle-earth at cost of losing it for himself, which is a little bit of a connection to Frodo because that's kind of what happens. He saves the Shire but loses it himself. And so there's all these different ways in which we can see this theme playing out. Bree is kind of that example of an, a semi edenic society, which is protected by people who are keeping all the bad stuff out. And the Shire also is having people keep the bad stuff out because the Rangers are watching those borders too. But in the case of the Breelanders, you've got the rude awakening that they kind of need after the Rangers leave. And then in the Shire, you have the same rude awakening when Saruman comes in and starts making everything really horrible. But in Rivendell, it's all about the memory of all those things that have happened in the past. And they don't get a rude awakening. They already had it years ago, and they're kind of closing themselves off. And the rude awakening that the Shire and Bree get are very different. One is just from outside attacking. You know, Bree more or less gets invaded, but never taken over. But they recognize, oh, the world that's just outside is a lot more dangerous than we realized. The Hobbit's realization comes from more the fact that we've kind of been invaded, yeah, but it's because there were rotten elements in our own society that let that in in the first place. 
So again, it's not a perfectly idyllic society. Neither is Bree. I mean, Fern, you know, Bill Fernie is there. He's not exactly a nice character either. But to the extent that either of these societies are kind of idyllic, they both lose that in a lot of ways. And then they both kind of go back to it a little bit. But Frodo has gone through too much to go back to that way of life fully. And he just, he also has, you know, other problems. He's been wounded too many times and he just can't live in Middle Earth anymore happily. But, you know, those are two slightly different things. So, again, looking at the whole big broad picture, I think the the interesting thing about it is you have these two perspectives on what the loss of innocence is. One of them is the the sadness of losing the innocence of, you know, not having to worry about terrible things. And there is a sadness in that because it's a thing that shouldn't have to be. But there's also a recognition of you do have to lose that at some point because the world we're in demands it. And sad as that is, you know, that's the way we have to deal with it in the here and now. And, you know, if we can ever reclaim Eden, that might be a great thing. But nowhere in the Lord of the Rings is Eden reclaimed. And nowhere in our lifetimes does that seem likely either. So that's my thoughts on this idea of innocence, maturity, the loss of innocence, and how all that kind of plays out and how it looks like thematically in the story. Let me know if you have any other elements of this that you think should have been addressed or if you have your own thoughts in the comments below. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up, share it around. Make sure you subscribe to catch my future content. Oh, and make sure you check the other videos in the playlist. Of course, all the other Tolkien tubers participating have put out some cool stuff for this Hobbit Day this year. If you're on YouTube, of course, make sure you click the bell icon so you don't miss any future notifications. Follow me on the platform formerly known as Twitter to get regular Tolkien-related trivia questions. And until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namarie. Thanks to all my channel supporters, especially elf friends Nathan DeFore, Robert Kindling, and Stephen Clayton.